Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I think the, the we were having a little bit of uh, um, a delay with the links. The links, are, I think, have now been shared. Uh, give us just one or two minutes. We are waiting for Justice Riechi to join, and then we can get started. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Ms. Lea. Sorry. Yes. Oh, the Kevin. judge. The judge is right. joined, yes. Okay, excellent. I think then we can get started. So good afternoon, uh, colleagues. I want to welcome all of you to our webinar this afternoon to talk about um, a matter that is close to, I think, many of our hearts. There have we've been filing, there has been filing of very many adoptions and um, and so as, as, the, as, as the bar bench and the CUC, it was felt that it was important that we have uh, this, this, uh, this conversation. So I want to welcome each one of you, wherever it is you're joining us from. Um, Nairobi is very cold. It's a cold, cloudy day in Nairobi, but I'm sure the conversation should keep us going and should keep us warm. At this point, I want to ask, Ms. Uh, Wendy, Wendy Muganda from the LSK, the Secretariat, to give her opening remarks. But uh, Karibuni, Karibu, uh, Judge, and Karibuni colleagues. 
Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Miss Leah Kigwasa, for the introduction and your time uh, taken to moderate this webinar. My name is Wendy Muganda. I'm the programs manager at LSK Nairobi branch. And uh, I would just like to thank all members who've taken their time to join this insightful webinar on best practice in adoption. Thank you, uh, speakers, for also um, taking the time to have this uh, discourse. So we are going to discuss uh, like um, best approaches when it comes to adoption, factors that the court considers when granting orders, how can an advocate successfully maneuver through an adoption matter, et cetera. So I would just um, uh, hand over to Ms. Lea Kigwatha and um, looking forward to very insightful uh, discussions thereafter. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Wendy, and uh, thank you, uh, LSK Secretariat, Nairobi, Nairobi branch, for organizing uh, this very useful conversation. So I will start by introducing myself. I realized I didn't introduce myself. My name is Lea Kibwatha, and I have the, the privilege of being your moderator uh, for this session. Our first speaker is my Lord Justice Stephen Nyangao Riechi. Um, Justice Riechi uh, attended Riamoni Primary School and uh, I'm going way back into history, Judge. <laughs> so, and uh, the Kano Secondary School and then Kakamega High School before joining the University of Nairobi to study Bachelor of Laws. He qualified for a diploma in law at the Kenya School of Law. He joined the judicial service uh, way back in 1986. I'm sure some of us judge were not yet born, but some of us, many of us were in primary school until where he served with the, he has served with the judiciary since then and he became a judge of the High Court uh, in 2006. He has previously served as the presiding judge in Bungoma and he is one of our judges in the family division at Nairobi in court to welcome Justice Riechi. I will introduce the other speakers, and then, um, then Justice Riechi, we will give you. We will start with you on the program. We will, we will hear a little bit from you. Now, the, uh, the our second speaker will be Mr. Ezekiel Kimani. Ezekiel Kimani is uh, works with the Directorate of Children's Services. He works with the Directorate of Children's Services as, um, as, a, as, as, a, as an assistant director at the director, Directorate of Children's Services. He's based at the Nairobi County Children's Services in the Family di Division, and he is also a lawyer and um, will soon be joining us as an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. If, if, if he hasn't already, he didn't invite me for his um, admission party. So if I missed it, uh, Kemani, or oh, you'll tell us when the party will be, but he's about to join us on the, on the bar. And then um, lastly, uh, we have Pauline Kitema. Pauline Kitema is a program manager with uh, the Kenya Children's Home Adoption Society. She is a social worker by profession with a diploma in social work. She has a wealth uh, of experience in matters of adoption and has done adoption work for 14 years. I also recognize the presence of uh, other judges on the forum, um, Justice, Justice uh, Patricia Nyaundi, we welcome you and we recognize you. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, Justice Odero will be joining us soon. Thank you, thank you so, thank you so much, my lords. Thank you, your ladyship, for joining us. So we'll start uh, with Justice Riechi. We can give you the floor to tell us a little bit about adoption and how we as advocates can make the process smoother and uh, have good outcomes in the process. Thank you, um, Skiwada. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to join in this conversation. Um, when you mentioned when I joined judiciary in 1986, Uh, that translates to almost 37 years in the judiciary. It makes me feel so old, but I don't want to admit that. Um, but I have been in the judiciary for that long. Time runs fast, but we have been. Thank you for this conversation about uh, child adoption in Kenya. I joined uh, this family division in October last year. And every Thursday, we deal with the uh, adoption, children adoption uh, matters. I must say for, uh, that I'm happy with the way uh, we are handling the children adoption proceedings. But um, we can improve on other areas where we have not been doing very well. And where we have done very well, we can even do better. Let's start with the basics. What is adoption? Um, even before we go to the what what is the definition of the adoption, is that um, in our society now, or even previously, the issue of adoption is not strange to them. It has been there, although not formalized but it was known, the process was known, who to be adopted, the obligations of the adapter, and the obligations of all the society were already known. But let's start that the act of us, uh, adoption as we know it now is really um, a process by which a child is placed with a legal parent, a process where a person takes parental responsibility of a child who is not the biological child of the, of the parent. Is, that is basically what you take. This, the child is not yours, you are not the biological parent, but you adapt that the process allows you to adapt that child, make him more your own, and you assume all the responsibilities of a parent and all the obligations of a parent, and you enjoy all the pleasures of a parent. What is the reason why, why adoption? It's the, 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 a child in society, a child is regarded as the property of society, of the family, of, of the clan, of the community, and of the nation. And therefore, every person in that community has an interest in the welfare of a child. And that there is need for societies to provide conducive environment for children for growth and development. That is basically something understood and something all, um, all societies embrace. Secondly, is that society, as a society, we have an obligation and a duty to all our children, whether they are your children, your brother's children, your uncle's children, or even another child within the community. And that's why all of us, I'm sure, you have at one time or another taken responsibility, financial, emotional, or whatever, of um, a child who is not your child. Some of us are paying school fees, probably. Some of us are taking care of, of children who, whose parents are not there. But it is because of our societal obligations to children. And in all of these cases, we try to find that the one common thing is that 
the children who need care and the protection, they need, they are, they, there is always a need to bring them within the family. This is from the realization that the family performs a very important role in the growth of a child. A child who, who grows within a family, grows within, has all the, 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 all the, the benefits of, 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 uh, of family. But now we are having a, a more uh, structured way of getting uh, children to our to our position or under our care. But what is the motivation for adoption now, currently, as we, we when we do these matters? I'm sure um, Kimani and Pauline will be able to elucidate much more on this. But I think from the from what we have in court, the motivation is, is as varied as, 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 as the applicants themselves. There are those who want to have a, adopt a child because they have been unable, due to medical reasons, to have one. That is, I think, is one, one of the real motivations. If you don't have a child, you, the doctor has told you all this, and you, you somebody now decides that I can have a family and children and I can adapt a child. There are those who also all have uh, their children already, biological children. But they also want either they want to add more, more children in their family or uh, others um, had two children. They have grown up, they have gone away. They feel lonely, they want another child in the house to keep them busy. The others who feel that, like, like mothers, they have one, one gender. Like a mother will be having only boys. And she th sits down and thinks uh, she doesn't have a girl. And I say, I'm going to go to the saloon. So for that reason, she wants to adapt a girl into, a, into the family. Or even when they have one gender or girls, and they'll want a boy in the family. That is also could be a motivation. So there are various reasons, and uh, I think um, Pauline and Kimani will be able to share them with us. But that is how, that's what motivates people to, to, to uh, uh, apply for, for for adoption. Uh, coming to the courts, the process. I think um, Pauline will will cover that. We know uh, from the uh, the Children's Act who 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 can adapt. We have three different types of adoption: international adoptions, local adoption, and kinship. But I don't want to. To, to do that, um, to mention that, but I would want to say who can be adapted. That is provided for um, in the Act. Any child resident in Kenya must be at least six months old, must be below 18 years, an abandoned child whose parents whereabouts are not known, and children willingly offered for adoption by, by the local parents all those ones can be adapted. And who can adapt? An adult Kenyan citizen must be at least 25 years old and not more than 65. I have never understood why the 65, but I think there must be a reason, perhaps we will not get to know from the psychologists, but the age difference between the child to be adopted and the adoptive parent must be 21 years. The reason for that, I don't know, but it must be apparent. We'll be, we'll shudder at a situation where uh, a 17 year old uh, is being adopted by a 21 year old or 20, 20 year old. So, so there must be a good reason for that. But we also have, the law provides for those who cannot adapt. So this, this is what we look for when, when we are doing the adoption process. 
we look will point us at who, who cannot adapt. If for answer, the, the applicant is of unsound mind, of course, will not allow you. If you have been convicted of a sexual offense before, will not allow you. Uh, indecent assaults, allegations or charges, will not allow you. Drug, drug trafficking, um, no. Offenses relating to firearm and ammunition, conspiracy to incitement, trafficking in persons, we cannot allow you. And more importantly, uh, in this new act, if you are convicted of corruption, fraud, extortion, forgery, will not allow you because we may not even know whether the documents you are giving us are not forgeries themselves. So we will not allow you to do that. So after that, the adoption process uh, is known. The applicant will go to the to, to the uh, to the agencies, the adoption societies, and make the application. We will get that information from Pauline. Uh, the process, but when it comes to us. Um, there are certain things which make will make us move faster. It makes us move faster because then all the reports which we need for us to make an informed uh, judgment are available. The applicant, for instance, must confirm that they have next the uh, following documents if once they, they, they have filed the application. The identity cards. The identity cards, one, one is to show that you are a Kenyan, if you are a Kenyan or a passport holder. It also helps us to establish your age so that if you are over 65 years old, uh, we advise you accordingly. And it also shows your nationality. Of the nationality of the applicant. There's another document which we require. I have mentioned just a few minutes ago about the people who cannot adapt. They must have been convicted of the offenses I had mentioned. And the way, the only way we can uh, find out that you have not been convicted of those offenses is to have. Um, what we call from the this year the certificate of good conduct. It it should show whether you have ever been convicted of one of those offences. We also will require that um, in the reports there is a statement of means. I mean, what do you do? How do you um, sustain yourself? Can you be able to sustain a child and provide? Um, all the, 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 the all the needs of the child. We also will want to know about your your health. So that's why we sometimes in we in fact invariably ask for a medical report. A medical report of the applicant so that we can know um, their health status um, and whether if their status has an impact in our decision making, whether to adapt or not. We also peruse the following reports and which we take very seriously, the reports of the adoption agency. Uh, Pauline will talk about it later on. We adopt the report of Guardian Ad Litem, whom we had already appointed uh, to give us information and um, the information we need in respect of the applicants. We report, we peruse the report from the Directorate of Children's Services. Uh, Mr. Kimani will talk about that one. And then if we, 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 we also need that in the event, if, even if we were to allow you, and then the unfortunate event, event that you are not there, we'll take care of the child. So you have to provide uh, the appointment of a legal guardian. In court, invariably we want to see the child who is being adopted. If he is old enough, we engage in a conversation with them. If they are over 14 years, they are supposed to get, uh, I think, yeah, they are supposed to get their consent 
uh, they know at least know what is going on and sometimes you ask whether they are in the, in the consent or not and then after all those documents we have received all those documents then we give you a date for 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 judgment so it's the process that once all those documents are available and they are positive the process is smooth and uh, we are able to to do, to deliver our verdict much more in, in an informed manner and in a more expeditious manner. So, in in in, in short, that is how we deal with it. But what we what does the look look for? And I've mentioned above the eligibility of the applicant to be to be to adapt the availability of the child to be adapted, which will be confirmed by the adopting agency, the suitability of the applicant in terms of medical, emotional, financial um, suitability, and above all, we look at um, the best interest of the child. That is the overriding um, consideration which we take into account before we give you any other uh, as we go move forward. And during the interview, I mean, in the court, we tend to see how children relate to the, to the parents, the adoptive parents. Um, if you find you are in, in the interview with the conversation with a child, um, he doesn't know, he's, he's, he's about 10 years, doesn't know his date of birth and um, he has never had a, a happy birthday present, then um, when you are talking to him, the answers are not as straightforward, then you find it, 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 it's a pointer that you need to find more about the adopted parent. Um, one of the things I ask children is whether they, uh, when they have stayed with them for some time, particularly all those who have stayed with them for some time, whether they beat them. Most of them, you can overhear the, the parents saying no. no. But when they say that they have, they have never been beaten by the, they have never scolded, they have never been, nothing has happened, then you start wondering whether that is a proper parenting. Uh, but I had, I've had two or three who tell me, ah, oh, yes, they beat me. When? If I don't do homework, uh, you know, that is now a good parent. They will find one who, tell, who told me, um, he, has, he, he, bought me, he bought me a present. For boys, nothing excites them like uh, a remote motor car. And for the girls, um, of course, we know what they want. Uh, just some, something nice to eat, a pizza will do, uh, and then this kind of thing. So you, you look at, those are the things which you look at. We also have to be satisfied that the consents which are which required have been uh, filed. And where, we also want to know whether the parent understands the effect of adoption. What is he going into? Um, and where there is one apparent who has who, has, who is giving out the biological parent who is who is giving the to child for for adoption will want to know that he understands the consequences that he loses all the rights to that child. And once we are satisfied with that, we we are able to to move forward and give our our approval for adoption. Thank you, Ms. Kiwada. Thank you. Thank you, Judge, uh, for that uh, summary of uh, what is required, especially the documentation and what the courts, what the courts are looking for. So we'll come back, uh, my, your Lordship, to you later. But for now, I want to give a chance to Pauline Kitema of uh, Kenya Children's Home Adoption Society. Now, um, Pauline, 
maybe you could put, switch on your camera because that's where the process starts with you before people can get to the court before people can get to their advocates the process starts with you maybe you can tell us a little bit about how uh, the process looks like from your end and what we should advise our clients to expect when they approach the adoption society thank you so much thank you madam Lea. all protocols observed uh an adoption process uh usually we want to convince the parents that it's a very social uh process very friendly many of the parents that will approach an adoption society will be tense because they do not know what to expect so we've built a serene atmosphere and we are friendly social workers that will take through the the, the clients through the inquiry bit. The inquiry is definitely the informing the parents or rather the clients, the adoption process from A to Z so that they can be able to make an informed decision. We allow them to go ponder and probably come back to proceed with the process in case they were not prepared because some of the parents will not have any information whatsoever about adoption. They will have heard probably from the village, so they come with the same language. So by the time we convince them that it is not buying a child and the process and everything, at times we feel they need to go and ponder, consult family where applicable, and probably come back for the documentation. The documentation is the, the, the forms that they pick from any adoption society that they go fill and return. Uh, among the documents that we will be expecting from the parents will be their copies of the IDs, just like we've been informed by the judge. There will be medical forms. I want, to, to, I want us to note that every application will be different. There is a checklist, but then People have different cases. We may say we want a marriage certificate, but then you find that this couple has been married for the last 15 years through a customary marriage, and uh, they do not have a marriage certificate. So you ask them to process, at the same time provide a foreign affidavit that will say that they've been married for the last 15 years and they have just legalized their process. We will also ask for an application letter. This is the undertaking by the applicants that they want to adopt a child, and they will give their motivation in that letter. If it's a joint uh, application, both applicants are supposed to sign, and of course the letter should be dated. We will have uh, referee forms that they go fill and return, a church letter not necessarily a church letter, but a religious affiliation, a recommendation letter from their religious uh, belief. We also have the financial documents, certificate of good conduct, birth certificate if they have their own biological children, and of course consents where the children have reached the age where the law says that they should consent, which is 10 years now. Death certificates where applicable, divorce documents, photos of their self or family, guardian form, and finally the certificate of acknowledgement, which indicates that they have read the memorandum for adopters and they have understood and they would want to, to forge forward. So once the Adoption Society has received all those documents, they should plan for an interview and a home assessment. The purpose for the interview and the home assessment is to check how prepared the parents are, and of course, see where they live, where the child will go to live, is the accommodation adequate, is it serene? Do we have any advice for them? And once that has been completed, we go to the case committee approval Every adoption society has a case committee that approves parents, defers, or declines. 
at times, of course, with reasons. So when an application has been approved, it means that it can move forward to the next stage, which is matching. Matching process includes other CCIs where the children are uh, domiciled. And then after matching, once we have found a match, someone would have said probably they are looking for a male child who is two years old. So together with the home, we do the matching process and then we do the introduction. Introduction is a very important phase in adoption, as I always say. Because this is the day you meet your hoped for child that you intend to live with for the rest of your life. On this day, we expect to hear the social background of the child and the legal. Of course, the police letters where the child was found and show you a photo of the child before you meet the child. The reason why we introduce the photos is because we realize that many parents were doing a lot of rejections to children. And we said, so that we can reduce the rejections, we should start with a photo. If the parent is comfortable with the history, with the theory and the photo, probably that is the time we move forward to introduce the child. Assuming all has gone well, after the, bond, after the introduction, we move to the bonding period. The bonding period will be different from what we call fostering period. Bonding period is the time that they take at the home together with the child so that they can familiarize themselves with the child. They can learn the behaviors of the child and the child also can get used to them so that we avoid a situation whereby they are going home, the child is wailing and the parents are confused. They do not want, know what to do. After the bonding period is complete and the home is comfortable and the society is comfortable and the parents are comfortable, then they go home. They go to their resident now and they stay with their and they stay with their child with the child as they wait for the 90 days that are provided for. The 90 days are three months. Every month they are supposed to go to the placing home and the placing adoption agency for what we call follow-up visits. In this follow-up visit, we are going to examine whether the child is continuing to bond with the family. Is the family comfortable with the child? Do they want to move forward? After the third month, that is when the advocates come in now, because that is when we ask them to introduce their lawyer to us or advocates, who will in return send an introduction letter so that we can submit our file the file of the parent and that of the child to them so that they can open the court file thank you all right uh thank you thank you very much pauline maybe pauline before i ask uh, kimani to speak yeah. you can say something a, a little bit about what is your role as an adoption society with regards to kinship adoption, where a child is not coming from a children's home and uh, that issue of how that works with the issue of bonding under the law. Okay. Our role as the Adoption Society is to vet the parents. Even though they are biological relatives, we do vet them again and form another file. And then we declare the child free for adoption. If, uh, for example, a couple has a child, and uh, the, the child belongs to the lady or the guy. One of them, or rather the biological parents of this child are supposed to offer the child for adoption. And then in jointly, the people wanting to adopt come again together. For example, if Mary and John were married and Mary has a child, Mary will offer the child and give up all the responsibilities and rights. But then so that she does not lose all that, she comes in again and uh, makes an application with John so that they can now adopt the child together. So the adoption societies will declare the child free for adoption. But then there is no the bonding period of the 90 days. Once the child has been declared free for adoption, the parents have been vetted and found suitable, then the case moves to court. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline. And uh, now we will ask uh, Mr. Ezekiel Kimani 
to take us to the part of the Director of Children's Services. Mr. Kimani is an Assistant Director of Children's Services and uh, he's also a lawyer. Welcome, Kimani. Thank you so much, Leah. And uh, a lot has been said by the judge and Colleen, so mine would be left to just highlighting a few issues that maybe my two speakers have not touched on. I want to talk about the national child care reforms. It is a reform initiative by the Directorate of Children's Services, where we want to take away all the children from institutions. We want to move away from institutional care to family-based care. And that is where adoption uh, comes in. Adoption is, a, uh, is an alternative family care where we want all those children in institutions to go. Uh, having said that, there are various uh, alternative family cares. We have adoption, we have foster care, we have guardianship, we have kafala, and all of them have actually been defined in the New Children Act. So among them, I believe adoption is better because of the protection that it gives to the child. Uh, well, it allows the child even to acquire uh, to acquire rights that are due to a biological child, including the right to inherit property. Now, uh, when you look at the schedule to the Act, it gives the uh, the children's home or what you call the CCIs a great period of ten years, to, uh, after which mm -hmm. it will be operation and uh, they will no longer be allowed to operate, legally speaking. So after that, after 10 years, where are we going to take our children? We are thinking as a department to use and employ other uh, alternative family, uh, family care options that are available. Now, I want to look at the new provisions of the Children Act that has brought about some changes that were not there and which I think it would be nice for me to look at. Now, the new act provides for the review of the adoption order. You realize that initially there was no such a provision and right now an applicant can move to court and ask the, uh, and make that application for the review. And of course, there are various grounds listed therein in which an applicant may ask the court to review the orders. So, so far, since the act came into force, I've not seen any applicant making such a, an application for review. But so, that is something that would be interest, uh, would be very interesting for all of us to see how it will pan out. Now, there is also a provision that I'm not very comfortable with, there is this provision that restricts uh, male uh, applicants, I'm sorry, from adopting, uh, adopting children, other than in instances where a child is uh, related to, to a male applicant. I believe that provision is uh, discriminatory, and we may need to call upon a few of you to go and challenge that provision in the High Court. Now, uh, there's another, uh, there's another uh, introduction in the act that was not there before, and uh, it's about the role of the National Council for Children's Services uh, on adoption matters. Now, you realize that currently, the role uh, under the function to declare children free for adoption is vested in adoption agencies. What now the law has come to do is to take away that function from Bolin and other adoption agencies and grant it to National Council for Children's Services. Now, the National Council for Children's Services are formulating, uh, uh, they are formulating the guidelines so that they can uh, be able now to properly I implement that law. They will come with regulation soon, but without that, I believe the function will be carried out by the adoption agencies. 
Now, uh, there is another issue on international or inter-country adoption. Uh, you, you realize that there is a moratorium on international or inter-country adoption. But what now the Act says is it, it some, to some extent allows international adoption, but it, it is subject to the lifting of the moratorium that was, uh, that was given, in, I think, in 2014 by the government. So once that moratorium is reviewed, we will see now uh, international adoption coming in. Yeah, th that's what I have to say there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kemani. And um, colleagues, I, I, I don't know if you are allowed to unmute and uh, clap for the presenters, but um, thank you very much for all the presenters. <laughs> I want to recognize the presence of uh, the presiding judge of the division, Karibu Sana Judge, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, so uh, we we have a few questions, but before we go to questions from the panel, I want to ask uh, Justice Riechi to address a, a question to Lord Justice Riechi or um, any of the other judges who are logged in. In terms of the paperwork, as a practice issue, I think uh, there has been a request during with the CUC meetings and the bar bench meetings about how we put together our paperwork so that we are able to make it easier uh, for the courts. I, I don't know if uh, Justice uh, Riechi or is still logged in and could say something about that. Yes, thank you, Leah. Um, I'm logged in, but now that the uh, presiding judge has come on, she can, <laughs> she, we can <laughs> welcome her with that, uh, to answer that question. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Rieti and all the other presenters, Mr. Ezekiel and uh, the lady from the Adoption Agency. Um, regarding what uh, Madam Kigwada has asked, I think it's something that we, myself, am very passionate about and I think the other judges. As I indicated in one of our bar bench meetings, uh, as judges, we, we really desire to move these adoption cases forward, and it is our wish to deal with them as expeditiously as possible. The main problem we face is that when we sit down to write the judgments, many of the documents are not in the file. So you find that either we are having to call the advocates, bring this, bring that one, or we just, in my case, sometimes I just don't write the judgment because I don't have the necessary documentation. And it's very unfortunate when I've given a judgment date, then on that date, the judgment is not ready. The parents are there, everyone is excited and I don't deliver the judgment. So we would request that the advocates, the adoption agency and the director children's services, all of you come together and assist us. Let us have what we need so that we are able to write these just the judgments and let a new child get a home, get a, a child get a new home. We have made a request that in as much as you upload these documents on the CTS, it would be so very helpful if you could give us physical copies of your bundles. Prepare a nice bundle I have always commended Madam Kigwada, her bundles are always very well prepared. And then we have, uh, give us, uh, send it to us through the court assistant, give us the bundle so that as we are sitting down to write the judgments, everything is before us, we write it, and on the day that it is due for delivery, we deliver. Uh, I, that's what I would say regarding the documentation. Please, let us have the requisite documentation so that uh, you know we don't have a situation where we, we are not able to write the judgment just because some documents are missing. Because even some of the uploaded documents, when we try to print them, they are faint, they are not very clear, uh, the, doc the pages are not properly paginated. You know, it just becomes one big mess and you're not inclined to write the judgment. 
Um, Justice Riechi, do you have anything to add regarding the documentation? Yeah, uh, you are right, Judge. I think it, it's rather embarrassing when when you are during the proceedings and you are referring to a document by one of our partners who has said he have filed this document. And when you go through it, you find certain um, documents which are supposed to have been annexed are not available. Um, it, it just shows how much we didn't take into account when we were, how much we didn't put much thought into what we were doing at the time. Granted, some of this, we, we give them to our assistants to compile, but it's always good before it goes out under your hand, you are satisfied that all the documents mentioned, particularly in your report, they are all there. Um, it saves us a lot of time, it saves a lot of anxiety. What are one thing I've noticed is that uh, the applicants are always anxious. Uh, who said, uh, Madam, you said when they come, they are anxious. They are even more anxious when they come to court <laughs> because they don't know what, what's going to happen. So it, it's like, let us take a bit of time and um, peruse the documents, find everything is ready. And we assure you that if everything is ready and correct and properly in the file, the matter will move much faster. Uh, to the expectation of the applicants. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Your Ladyship, my Lord. Now, uh, I want to pose a question to the to Ezekiel Kebani from uh, the Director of Children's Services. Uh, why? Uh, I think uh, the question I want to ask is: Once an order for the the the, the court has made an order for the director of children's services to investigate. And uh, what should an advocate do next? How does, uh, in terms of the procedure, what happens next so that the process, so that the document, the process now moves to your stage and what can an advocate do to, you know, to fast track that process through the director of children's services so that we reduce complaints that it is the, rep the report of the director of children's services that's taking long. What can we do to facilitate uh, the quick issuance of the report? Because the courts only give 45 days. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Leah. Once an order has been given by the court, what would expect the advocate to do is to serve us with the order and the application with all its annexures. Because we realize our role is actually to help the court to make an effective decision over that matter. So without the application, without the uh, annexures, we may not be of much help to court. So we normally insist that we are served, number one, with the court order, number two, with the application, and all the annexures. Again, we also insist that we must be served with the contacts of the applicants for the purposes of reaching out to them uh, for carrying out the whole visit and the interview. So once all those documents are availed, we normally even produce those reports in less than 10 days, some cases. Right, okay. All right, uh, thank you very much. Now, Pauline Kitema spoke a little bit about kinship adoptions. Allow me to ask, to pose this question uh, both to the judges as well as uh, the Director of Children's Services. And even Pauline at this point, uh, you can also uh, you can also chime in what special considerations are given for kinship adoptions justice odero uh, justice riecho justice riechi what special considerations are given for kinship adoptions because currently we don't have the rules which are anticipated by the act but uh, how what special considerations are given to to kinship adoptions from the judge's perspective. And then we can also hear from Ezekiel and from Pauline on that. Okay, if I may uh, try to answer, I think for kinship adoptions, in our case, we're looking at a situation where one, a child may have been orphaned and therefore that child is kind of left high and dry. Somebody steps in, an auntie, an uncle, a grandparent steps in to take over the parental role in respect of that child. 
Um, Justice Rieti had earlier talked about the, our African society and the fact that we, we, we view children as, you know, children belong to all of us. So you find in a situation where a, a parent is struggling to raise a child, could be from issues of lack of finances, issues of health, maybe the parent is unwell or whatever it is, another relative will step in and say, okay, here I am, I'm, I'm ready and willing to take up the responsibility of raising this child because the parent is incapable for one, two, three reason. Another reason that I see very commonly, I don't know how valid it is, and probably the adoption agency, Mr. Kimani can address it, is, uh, you know, the cases where the relative lives abroad and the relative uh, feels that I'm able to offer this child a better life. I live in America, I live in the US, I live in Germany, I live in Canada. I, I am willing to uh, look up, take, adopt my sister's child. Of course, once the child comes to live with me in that foreign country, they will be, um, they will be able to access healthcare, they'll be able to access education, um i don't know judge Rietchi, you didn't touch on it but i'm wondering is that a valid reason so that i my child can my niece can go to college in canada is that a valid reason for adoption <laughs> <laughs> i think when we come to motivation of why people adapt and give our children for adoption there are many but judge as you rightly put it i'm seeing I think a trend now where somebody in the US or UK or in any of the European countries adopts a child and wants to take them over. And in most cases, they are, they are, those are children are quite old, over 10 years. And uh, when you speak to them, their motivation, do you, uh, do you agree to be the, the, the adoption? Yes. Why? I want to go to the US. That is, that's what they tell you. So if you tell them uh, we will allow the adoption, but you will stay in Kenya, he says no. That's, that's not what I want. Yes, uh, kinship adoption, um, the one which touches me and I think uh, is where uh, either sibling has died and has left a child or a child has died and the grandmother who has been taking care of the child uh, but she's not over 65. Sometimes they don't. We don't ask them, but they want to adopt the child. One month, I think I had a, one where the, the motivation for adoption of the kinship is because this girl had a child um, before she got married. She she now had somebody who is ready to marry her, but does not want to take responsibility for the child. And that's, the mother was telling me that. And uh, that's why I want, uh, we want to adopt the child. She has been with me. And when I ask the mother, the mother says that is the reason. But some of the things which we ask for, I don't know whether the um, Kimani, uh, I mean, uh, Kimani or Pauline, you ask, uh, kinship. That, that, that adoption is already there. They have taken the responsibility of the children. But now if they come and you ask them, oh, where, where is the mother passed on? Uh -huh. Do you know the father? I mean, you're asking the mother whether he knows the father of that child. She tells you, I don't know. Um, because we need the, the father's consent. I don't know. Then you need to swear an affidavit that you don't know the, the father. How do we know that the father has not exist? You know, what I'm saying, in terms of kinship, by the way, we should adopt a process which is more facilitative than obstructive, because that it is already existing. But coming to you, whether giving a child a better a better life in the UK will be a better a reason for adoption, we come back. Will that be the best interest of the child? If yes, then it is. If not, it isn't. Thank you. Uh, Madam Kikwada, just before Mr. Ezekiel steps in, I would also like to throw this question to maybe the, 
the director of children's services, as well as the adoption agencies. Uh, Justice Riechi mentioned that many of these kinship adoptions, especially where the child um, is being adopted by a Kenyan resident living abroad, you find that the children tend to be older. They are above 10, maybe in their teens, 14, 13, 15. I'm just wondering, Mr. Ezekiel and the adoption agencies, do you inquire or are you able to assess whether the real reason why the person wants to adopt this child is because they basically need a helper in the sense that they need help with their own children who they may be having. We all know that abroad is not as easy as it is in uh, African countries to get help in the house. It's something that's very expensive. So you end up doing all the work yourself as a parent and yet you have two young children also. So is, you know, when I come here and I say, now I want to adopt my sister's child, you know, is it really because I have this love for this child and I want a better life for her? Or is it just because I want this child to come and assist me in looking after my children? That's something that has always been in my mind. And I wonder whether the DCS or the adoption agencies have uh, a way of assessing what is the genuine reason? Okay, I think um, Mr. Kimani and then Pauline, you can say something about that. And then we can move on to the next question in terms of motivation and kinship adoptions. Well, in terms of motivation, I would allow Pauline to go uh, to take it up because it, uh, they are the agencies that are tasked with the responsibility of ascertaining the suitability of the applicants to adopt. But even from where I come, uh, from where I sit, eh, I don't see anything wrong when my relative adopts my child so that they can go and get an opportunity abroad. In abroad, I believe uh, they have a better health care than we do have here. They have a better education system. And uh, other than the issues the judge is raising, I believe uh, the children stand to, uh, to, 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 to accrue most benefit. And in any case, Justice Riechi says, when such a situation uh, comes to him, he considers the best interest of the child. Now, having said that, uh, allow me now to look at the special consideration that kinship adoption is. And uh, I believe Pauline had just said it uh, during her introductory uh, remarks, that there is, no, there, there is no requirement for the mandatory bonding period of three months. Uh, because we are related, we don't uh, need you to uh, go through that. Another consideration is that we don't necessarily require a child to be committed into an institution or a CCI. And the requirement for the 65 years uh, is, not a requirement, is not a requirement. It is an exception to the rule because the child is related to the applicant. At the same time, the age difference of 21 years is also an exception to the rule, such that that restriction is not pl uh, placed to persons related to the child. Thank you. All right, okay. Thank you, Mr. Kimani. Uh, Pauline, are you still there? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Madam Le, I'll speak about uh, the motivation, some of the motivation that uh, we come across during the kinship adoptions. Uh, first of all, we will understand that the child still remains in the family. And one of the motivations that we've had over and over would be separated parents. John and Mary, allow me to use John and Mary again. John and Mary have a child. But they have both separated. John has remarried and Mary is married with her own family and the child was left with the grandparents and of course a young sister who is there taking care of the child and now this child, this, this sibling grows up and wants to take care of this child. Most of the time you'll find that they're taking care of the child and within time they get greener pastures I would call them that, or 
uh, avenues to, to, to go abroad. And now they look around and they say, who will be left with this child that I have been taking care of now that my parents are aged? So they will come forward and give that motivation. In that scenario, we are going to request both parents, even if they are separated, to come forward and give their consent. Uh, the other motivation that we hear will be uh, terminally ill parents. A parent is terminally ill and not able to take care of the child. The children have already moved to live with the relatives. Others will say that uh, the mother is present, but the mother is physically absent. The, the relative who wants to adopt the child has tried to support these children, like sponsoring the school fees, taking care of the welfare through the mother, but it is not working. The mother could be alcoholic, could be absentee, and so they realize, or rather they, they say, why can't I take the child and be with the child so that I can offer parental guidance since I am willing? Most of the time we want to know whether there is anybody else in the family who is willing to stay with these ch children or child. In a situation where we have a child that is younger, we had a case, we had a scenario where a client wanted to adopt the older child, like Justice uh, Maureen is saying. And uh, we were like, why do you want to adopt the older one? Just the reasons that she has said that uh, in abroad, you will not need a house girl when you have a bigger child. But if you adopt the small one, you will need someone to take care of them. So in that case, we now advise them we cannot do that because of the sibling separation. And in that case, not unless they are willing to adopt both or leave them both here and continue supporting. Most of the time, the parents want to offer physical parental guidance and taking care of these children while they see them. And the parents offering the children are times when you hear that uh, the mother is present and they do not know where the father of the child is. We always remind them, every child has a father. And so they, they try to trace the father where possible. And where not possible, we do the son affidavit to say that uh, the whereabouts of the father are unknown. Thank you. All right. OK, thank you very much. So I'm going to move to the questions in the chat. Uh, Esma Sharia. Your question about whether an adoption can be reversed, I think uh, Ezekiel touched on that. Kimani mentioned the new requirements of the act with, rever with regards to review, reversal, and uh, appeals. And then uh, Sharon Mulomi is asking, can a US citizen who was a former Kakuma refugee adopt his young relatives who are still refugees registered in the UNHCR in Kenya? Do Kenyan courts have jurisdiction in such a case? I think in a few years ago, there was a refugee case. There was a case of a refugee in our courts. But I think this is a question that can be answered together with uh, the other issues around surrounding Kenyans resident abroad and, uh, and foreigners. Kenyans resident abroad and, 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 and foreigners resident in Kenya. How are the courts handling that? Uh, Justice Riechi, Justice Odero, how are the courts handling cases of Kenyans resident abroad? We've already mentioned them a little bit. And uh, foreigners resident in Kenya, as well as then maybe you can say something about uh, the refugee status. Can a refugee adopt in our courts? Um, on the issue of Kenyans who are resident abroad, uh for for the courts because the law provides that uh, the party seeking to adopt should be a kenyan citizen uh under the new constitution now we have those who hold dual citizenship they may be kenyans they may also hold american or canadian citizen uh, i think that for as courts we are allowing adoption by kenyan citizens who are resident abroad whether they are just resident or whether they now have attained uh, citizenship of the foreign country where they live. For us, so long as there's proof of Kenyan citizenship, then we are we are able to proceed and uh, handle the matter. 
Regarding, uh, we also uh, take the same view with respect to a Kenyan resident abroad who is married to a foreigner. A Kenyan who is uh, married to a foreigner. Regarding the refugee status, I've not really come across uh, such a case. The only case, uh, okay, regarding Kenya foreigners who are resident in Kenya, I have only dealt with one case, and in this case, the foreigner actually had uh, Kenyan. One of the foreigners had uh, resident status in Kenya, so that one I proceeded with it. But for foreigners who are, let's say, British citizens or American citizens resident in Kenya, I have not yet come across it. Um, Regarding the issue of the refugees, off the top of my head, I would I would assume that th if this refugee was in Kakuma and then got relocation to wherever, then really is he a Kenyan citizen? I don't think so. A person holding refugee status in Kenya, I don't know whether they would be qualified to be deemed to be Kenyan citizens, would they then be able to come and adopt on the basis that I was a Kenyan citizen and now I'm adopting my relative who I left in Kakuma? I don't know. I, I think it would require some thinking. I would have to think about it. I can't give a straight answer right now. I don't know whether just three has encountered such. No, um, <clears throat> I haven't encountered, but the position of a refugee is that he's not a citizen of Kenya. Yes. He's, uh, he's, uh, Kenya is a host country. In fact, if, he, if he's in, uh, in Kakuma, he's, he's under the protection of the UNHCR. And even when they are here, they, they are not even issued with the citizenship card, but they are, the mode of identification is the alien card. It does not confer citizenship to any Kenyan to, the, to them. So I'd be very um, reluctant to uh, have to um, approve a process unless it is something approved by the UNHCR and the United Nations guidelines. So uh, to be on the safe side, no. And, and, I, and I think those are very critical points, especially because the Act now says that foreigners and Kenyans resident abroad can only adopt their relatives. Their so relatives. I think, yeah, even when the moratorium is lifted, I think we will have, um, we will still have to contend with the Act requirements mm -hmm. that uh, th that that can they can only it can only be a kinship adoption. Uh, Caroline Wanjiko is asking about. Um, can a sole female applicant adopt a male child? Uh, maybe we can pl pl place that to you, Pauline. We, in view of the new act, the 2022 act, can a sole female applicant adopt a male child under the guidelines on special circumstances still operational? Thank you. Uh, according to the new act, 2022, Section 186, Part 1, and A, it says the court may make an adoption order on application by a sole applicant. It doesn't tell us whether the sole applicant cannot adopt a boy, and so we take it positively that a sole applicant will be allowed to adopt a male child we we've not yet gotten the regulations we are still waiting the special guidelines were for the other act that didn't have this that had a prohibition on the same section okay thank you thank you very much pauline i think we are uh, we have uh, handled the issue of bonding pauline and ezekiel have talked about bonding period uh, in a kinship adoption uh, adoption and citizens who are residents abroad. Natasha Monari, your question has also been answered. Lucy Kamau is asking, why are parents who have offered their children for adoption being asked to appear in court for adoption matters, yet adoption in Kenya is a closed adoption? Uh, Justice Odero, uh, Justice Riechi, I think what Lucy is referring to is that in Kenya you can't take your child, unless it's a kinship adoption, if I deliver a child, I cannot take the child and give that child to a 
stranger to adopt in an open adoption where I'm the one choosing the adopter. So we have closed adoptions uh, where you know the parent places and where the child is is give to whom the child is given is not in the control of the parent. And she's asking why are the are they being asked to appear in court? Um, the, yeah, the, on my part, I think um, I have not been asking parents in those circumstances to appear in court. The ones where I ask the parent to appear in court is where it is a kinship adoption. And the parent is now, be, I, I do ask them to appear and uh, give me confirmation that yes, this is my sister. Yes, I am consenting to my sister adopting my child. But in a case where a, a person delivers a baby and then volunteers the child to a children's home for adoption, then generally speaking, I rely on the consents which have been filed and are placed in the, in the file. I would not in those circumstances demand that the biological parent appear in court. Once they have signed the consents and those are availed to me by the adoption agency, then I rely on those signed consents. I don't ask the parent to appear. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Colleagues, we have only about five more minutes, so we'll just tackle a few more of these questions, and then um, we might have to have another forum because there are so many questions. There are questions about what happens when the applicant turns 65 or if one of the persons is above the age of 65 years. And I think that's something that maybe uh, Pauline or Ezekiel, you could want to say something about what your recommendation is where one person turns 65 or, or you know, if they turn 65 before the judgment. Well, if one of the applicant has attained the age of 65 years, then that ad adoption is good. That adoption can be granted. The only problem arises when the two of them turn 65 years. So that is when there is a problem. That is my thinking. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel. And and then finally, a question for the process. Uh, who should be a guardian ad litem? A guardian ad litem is it a relative a social worker a friend because what the act does is that the act sets out the responsibilities but it does not um, it does not set out what are their their qualifications should be uh just isodero what how are the courts uh, handling the guardian ad litem question who makes a good guardian ad litem for us to be able to advise our clients to help the process along okay on my part i initially I took the view, and this is the view I had when I was handling adoptions in Mombasa, that the, the guardian ad litem, because this is a guardian who is supposed to come to court to represent the child, the child only, and uh, to act in the best interest of the child. So my view was that this person should not be a relative of the uh, adopting parents, because then they may be biased. Uh, that is how I looked at it. But when I started working here, I realized that in quite a number of cases, they choose a guard. I think the, the applicants confuse a guardian ad litem and a guardian. So when they are told, go and look for a guardian ad litem, they feel that, oh, it must be somebody who I trust to look after the child in case I'm not there. My own view, and it's not necessarily the law, is that I... I know that there are some social workers who present themselves as guardian ad litem. I feel that they may be more qualified in the sense that they are more objective and they know what is required of them. And they are therefore able to give you a very in-depth report. But I also know that uh, they do not come for free. They do charge a fee and they may be couples who cannot or are not do not want to pay a fee. Right now, I think we don't have very much clarity on who should be a guardian ad litem. Um, I'm made to understand that in the new act, there is going to be uh, better clarity in the sense that the, the national 
the, the body that was mentioned is now going to have a list of persons who are approved as guardian ad litems. And I think that is the good way forward because that will now help. We'll be able to sell, you're told to go and look at this list. The way you look for a lawyer is the lawyer registered with LSK. Then you proceed, you select your lawyer. So I think for guardians ad litem, a similar situation would be helpful. Because some of them, to be very honest, don't know why they're there. All right. Uh, thank you, Judge. So uh, there's one final question, and I'll direct, I'll direct this uh, question to you, Pauline, because uh, it's the adoption societies that do placement. The old act expressly disallowed homosexuals from adopting. The new act is silent. Is it to be assumed that homosexuals can now adopt in Kenya? So, case, uh, Pauline, are the adoption societies going to be placing uh, homosexuals now that the Act has removed the prohibition? We've, uh, we've not yet received such a request, and we also posted the same question in another forum. So we are still waiting to know what really is the stand, because uh, if it is silent, then it is not prohibiting then we are left wondering, even ourselves, so what happens when such a client comes to us? Do we turn them away? And what law would we quote to turn them away? So that is something we are still waiting for clarifications from our regulator so that we can be able to know what is the way forward or probably in our next TCUC, probably the judiciary will be able to answer that for us. Madam Kigwada, is uh, homosexuality still a crime under the penal code? As far as I know, your ladyship, it is. Then there's your answer. Because then, uh, are you not saying that this person is 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 going against the provisions of the penal code? If, as Justice Riechi pointed out to us, that the new act now prohibits people who have been convicted of corruption mm -hmm. from adopting. Uh, then really, if that if it is still remain, retained in our books as a criminal offense, mm -hmm. then the, I think the adoption agencies, their hands are tied until we, we lift that, provi that uh, pro prohibition in the penal code. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, colleagues, for the very elaborate questions which shed light on a lot of the issues and a lot of the questions that we come across in the process. Uh, we are out of time, but I will ask uh, the speakers to just make one concluding a concluding remark, one sentence in closing. Yes. Uh, that is uh, Riechi, Justice Odero, and then Pauline, and then Kemani. Uh, thank you very much, Leah. <clears throat> I think adoption is beautiful. We must make it beautiful. We must make it family friendly. We must base it on our family. And we can only do this if we, for instance, one of the challenges which we are facing now is the issue of uh, the confidential nature of our work. And one of the issues is whether uh, having virtual hearings of adoption maintains that confidentiality. Uh, it's something we need to ponder. Again, it's the convenience uh, it, it, it gives us, and it gives the children who are the subject of our attention. We must, as all players, uh, if we want to remain in, to have it beautiful, we must, all of us, ensure that there is integrity in the uh, adoption process. There is no commercialization about the activities we undertake. There is no corruption. There is clean, and the, the, what is the motivating motivating us is the welfare of the child we are seeking to place under adoption. Thank you very much for this meeting. Uh, thank you, my Lord, and thank you for your time. I don't know if Justice Odero, Justice uh, Nyaundi was also in earlier, make uh, some concluding remarks for our... Okay, our uh, I just want to thank the speakers. This has been a very engaging interaction. 
I think um, we need more of such interactions and probably once the, uh, commit the council has been set up and is up and running, we may need to have another session because there are some things that will change after the council comes in and uh, starts its work. Um, I seem to think that uh, there were many questions. People still wanted to engage some more. We may consider having a, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face interaction at some point later in the future. Uh, we shall try to see how we can organize that. But otherwise, it has been very engaging and very helpful. And once again, thank you very much to all the speakers and the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. We'll call on you to close finally after Pauline and Ezekiel give their final sentences, their final comments, and then Justice Odero, uh, you can close for us. You can give us leave to log off after Pauline and Ezekiel. Thank you so much. Uh, I wouldn't feel satisfied if I didn't say that uh, we would be very happy to receive timely updates from the advocates. Tell us where you're getting challenges so that you can be able to help. We want to help our parents, our clients to work with them hand in hand. We pledge to work to them up to the time they receive their birth certificate. And we should also remember that even the most experienced person was first a learner. So you shouldn't feel that you're doing it for the first time. I'm sure there are so many people in the platform who will be willing to help us so that we can uh, fast track the process. Our biggest challenge is uh, the cases that stay for so long in court without finalizing. Therefore, also making it difficult for the CCIs to close the files for the children that they've given us to place for adoption. Thank you so much for this forum and I'm looking forward to many more. And of course, we'll be available for any advice whatsoever. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. And uh, Ezekiel? Uh, thank you, Leah. I, I would want to thank all the adoptive parents for taking over these children. For you to take over a child who is not related to you, to give them a hope, to give them a future, it takes a lot of self-sacrifice and self-denial. So from our end, from the Directorate of Children's Services, we encourage them to come over so that they can adopt these children. And I also want to encourage all other players in the adoption process to help us track this process so that as many children can be adopted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kimani. So I'll now hand over to the presiding judge of the division uh, to give us leave in the old days before virtual court, we used to dress the court until uh, we are given leave to leave. So <laughs> for today's session, I'll ask you, Justice Odero, to release us with your blessings. And thank you yes. so much for allowing us to have this session. Thank you very much for everyone who has participated. Uh, we've come to the end, but I think we still have um, a lot that we needed to say or we wanted to say. So hopefully we'll have another session in future. But for now, we close this session and I wish everyone a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Your Ladyship.